Around 10,500 BC, an unusual child was born near Persia. He was raised among the people of Ararat and possessed uncanny abilities of clairvoyance. The boy was called Ra Ta and would grow to become a respected prophet for his country. At the age of 21, Ra Ta became convinced that the time had come for himself, his king, and a tribe of the king's people to migrate south into Egypt. According to his prophecies, the migration was to take place because Egypt was a land more conducive to the activities of spiritual forces in the earth. A spiritual revival was about to occur on the planet, and Egypt would provide a safe haven when there came about the eventual physical destruction of Lemuria and Atlantis. And so Ra Ta, his king, and a group of 900 soldiers, women, and children invaded the Nile Valley and found a people unequipped for war. On the other hand, the invading king's army was totally prepared. The thought of any real fighting between the two groups was preposterous. And so Egypt's native king, Re, surrendered himself and his entire peoples to the invaders rather than shed even one person's blood. So with little violence, although it was condemned by his people, Re placed Egypt under the rulership of the invaders from the north. The two nations reached a fairly amicable relationship, that is, until the invading king introduced a system of taxation and governing laws to gain control of the country. Uprisings among the people became common, especially among the native Egyptians who had seen themselves and their power usurped in favor of the conquerors. But more than that, after the invasion, Egypt had begun experiencing a great immigration of people because of the earth changes Rata had predicted and they had brought with them their own cultures and religious practices. The Egyptian nation was becoming completely fractured and ungovernable. But in the midst of rebellion and dissension, the invading king conceived the idea of establishing a new government, chosen by himself, and then abdicating the throne once it was in place. To rule the country, he picked three men, his 16-year-old son, Ararat, an Egyptian scribe, Arat, who was well respected and loved by the natives, and Rata as high priest. The three then chose 12 counselors for the nation, selecting people from among the Atlanteans, the Egyptians, and the conquerors from the north. However, one section of the populace was completely overlooked and essentially unaffected by the new government, the slaves. They were pitiful creatures, not fully human, sometimes half beast. Many had migrated with the Atlanteans. Their deformities were as diversified as they were, half human and half creature. Some had the limbs of the beasts of the field with cloven hooves or hairy paws. Others had claws or feathers or scales that glistened in the heat of the sun. Those who suffered the most misfortune had such problems as the head of a man in the body of a horse or the head of a jackal upon the body of a human. According to the Casey material, these creatures caused the beginning of two things that exist in this day. Mythical tales of legendary creatures such as the centaur, the cyclops, and the mermaid, and they were also the first group to experience mass prejudice and segregation. As slaves, they weren't subject to the country's laws governing humans. So programs aimed at improving the nation swept throughout the society. No area of life seemed unaffected, the new government promised equality to all. There were reforms in agriculture, in commerce, and in social responsibility. The nation made itself accountable to the people, and for a time, the greatest challenge seemed to be pulling the country's energies together so that everyone was treated equally under the law, at least those who weren't slaves. In order to keep all improvements financed, Ararat opened mines in Egypt, Persia, and Abyssinia. The Egyptian economy was booming. The three heads of state and their 12 counselors encouraged communication with other nations. Trade routes were developed, and the nation's treasuries soared. It appeared as though nothing could stop the country. Everything appeared perfect for a period of years. And then the high priest had an idea. Just as he had seen done in other lands, Ra Ta began to encourage the people to establish definite family homes and consecrated monogamous marriages. For one man, there should be one woman, 
This was a challenging idea as the Egyptian nation did not have the institution of marriage but instead practiced the separation of men, women and children into different quarters for training and education, arranging conception when necessary. The high priest's plan pleased some, irritated a few and confused many. But to set an example, Rata and his female companion, a woman named Ajua who had come with him from the north, began raising their own family. Eventually, Rata's idea became the law of the land, and many were enraged by what they saw as the high priest establishing personal moral decrees for everyone. An undercurrent of protest began to spread throughout the country, though it was a protest that would boil just below the surface for many years. Rata also began to establish temple services for spiritual education and physical well-being. Two principal temples built in the shape of small pyramids were constructed to serve the people. The Temple of Sacrifice became a hospital for physical health, and the Temple Beautiful emphasized mental and emotional health, which, in turn, facilitated personal, spiritual growth and vocational training. And in the process, the High Priest decided upon yet another plan, controversial to many of his people. He felt it was the country's obligation to improve the life status of the Atlantean slaves. And though on the surface all agreed upon the ideas of equality and the oneness of all life and the concept of service to all, some couldn't help but feel more equal than others. In fact, many of the Atlanteans couldn't begin to accept the thought that they were no better than the slaves. And so a second undercurrent of discontent began to spread throughout the nation. But Rata remained totally oblivious to the problems some of his reforms were creating. He thought all was well in Egypt and that all the people were united behind him. As a result, he began to spend greater amounts of time away from the nation, traveling to the Pyrenees and to Persia and to Atlantis, trying to gather the world's knowledge for the benefit of the country. And while he was away, the people noticed that some of the nation's other priests and counselors weren't so stringent with Rata's guidelines after all. In the Temple of Sacrifice, they began brewing strong drink and took part in debaucheries of every description. When Rata returned and discovered the corruption in the temple, however, a great turmoil arose and people had to return to their restricted ways immediately. Finally, some of the Egyptian and Atlanteans had had enough and they decided the time had come to overthrow the high priest. Together, they conceived a plan. In service to the state, in one of the temples, was one of the most beautiful women in the country. Her name was Isris. She was the king's favorite dancer, and the plotters chose her to fulfill their plans. Whenever Rata was in the country and working in the temples, some of his enemies found occasion to put him together with Isris in closer and closer proximity. Others took frequent occasion to point out the woman's obvious beauty. They convinced Rata that her physical charms were an outward manifestation of her inner spiritual beauty. They pointed out that the high priest's own spiritual strength was reflected in his apparent physical perfection. In time, they convinced Rata that he and Isris were obligated to conceive a child together. From their union could come the first perfect human specimen out of Egypt. The child would be a symbol for the country's own spiritual evolution and a sign of hope for all the people. So Rata fell into the trap laid for him by his enemies, and in time he and Isris had a baby girl. Both were shocked and surprised by what followed with the birth of their daughter. Immediately, the conspirators cried out for the banishment of the high priest. They spread the word of what had transpired to all the people and called for the king's intervention at once. Rata had broken one of the nation's most important social reforms. He had written the law that no man might take to himself more than one companion, and yet he had been the one to break it. This Rata was not fit to be the nation's spiritual leader. Rebellion and revolt erupted throughout the entire country. Not since the invasion years earlier had Egypt been in such turmoil. Those enraged by Rata's work with the slaves renounced the high priest. Others defended him, saying the high priest was greater than the law, 
the country stood on the verge of civil war. The problem pitted father against son and divided many a household. Even some of Rata's children by Azua called for their father's banishment. And the whole question fell into King Ararat's lap. It was left for him alone to decide the issue and the proper course of action, whether forgiveness or banishment from Egypt. According to the Edgar Cayce readings, this was the most difficult decision the king would ever make. For unbeknownst to either Rata or Isris, the king had fallen in love with the girl. Although it was not easy, Ararat tried to put all personal feelings aside. At last, the king issued his proclamation. Rata was to be banished forever from the country he had helped to build. Isris was to be banished as well. More than 200 of Rata's strongest supporters decided to forsake the beauty of Egypt and follow their high priest across the desert into exile. The beautiful baby girl born to Rata and Isris was kept by the king as political prisoner. Though in truth, the king kept the baby girl as a means of being reminded of the woman he loved and would never see again. So Rata and Isris and their followers finally found asylum many hundreds of miles to the south in the land of Nubia, today known as Ethiopia. It was a matriarchal society, though oftentimes warlike in nature, and they were highly suspicious of Rata and his people. But in time, the Nubians saw how the high priest's constant meditations brought peace throughout the entire nation, and eventually they opened their country to the group. But by that time, however, Rata had begun to isolate himself from all but his closest counselors and from Isris, with whom he had fallen in love. His banishment from Egypt had been devastating. Not only did the high priest feel he had betrayed his people and his spiritual mission, but he felt as though he had betrayed his God. Nonetheless, Isris stood by his side and became his chief counselor. She took his advice and his words to the Nubian people, who began to revere both of them as great spiritual leaders. The 200 that had followed the pair into Nubia mixed easily into the country, and in a very short period of time, many of Rata's reforms that had begun first in Egypt gained a stronger foothold in this new country. Soon the entire nation of Nubia became transformed into a land of promise, a land of education, a land of plenty, and a land of great spiritual significance. Wise men from throughout the world descended into Nubia to see what Rata and the Nubian people had accomplished. News of Rata's deeds and the magnificence of Nubia's growth crept back into Egypt, and many of the Egyptian natives began to call for the high priest's pardon and swift return. To the south, Rata and his people were too busy to even consider such a return. The Nubians followed Rata's suggestion and began establishing definitive homes for the raising of a family and the consecration of one man with one woman. In time, Rata and Isris had two additional children, though always longing for the daughter they had been forced to leave behind. As the years passed, the Nubians found that each of the priests' suggestions became a success for the country. There appeared to be no problem in the entire nation that could not be solved. In spite of these things, those closest to Rata, Isris, and her counselors began to worry about the high priest. Rata continued to spend much time alone in personal reflection and contemplation, and his constant state of mental anguish over the sins of his past were taking its toll. He seemed to be aging at an alarming rate. But he simply brushed their concerns aside, offered his advice and his reforms, and continued to spend much time alone. Because of his constant meditations and periods of reflection, Rata began to gain understandings of the earth and the universe and the physical dimension that had never existed before. In time, he gained a clearer awareness that there was but one force operating in the universe, a force for good which humankind could channel into every aspect of their lives, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Meanwhile, Egypt remained in the midst of inner and outer turmoil. The country was being torn apart. 
With Rata out of the way, various priests began to vie for positions of power, creating internal upheavals and conspiracies. Others tried to set themselves up as Rata's replacement. The ancient practice of animal worship was re-established. The spiritual state of the nation was in total chaos. Immigration into the country continued as Atlantis sank for the third and last time, causing a great migration of people, good and bad. And as more Atlanteans entered, the status of the slaves sank even lower. The old class structure resurfaced. They began a time of great intimidation and political coercion. The various revolts and turmoils tested Ararat's abilities to the limit. But these problems also laid the groundwork for the possibility of Rata's eventual return. Continuous messages of the high priest's activities came into Egypt. Hepseth, one of the wisest and most learned Atlanteans throughout all of Egypt, worked diligently for Rata's return. He was totally against the uprisings, and the practice of segregation continued by many of his own people. In great secrecy, Hepseth stayed in constant communication with Rata on the one hand, and continued to make positive remarks about the high priest to the Egyptian king on the other. Even some of Rata's conspirators begged the king to recall him. Others claimed that the high priest should be forced to return, otherwise their nation would collapse. Many began to work with prayer and meditation on a national level, hoping the uprisings would stop and that Rata would return. The king's own father counseled his son that the high priest was needed by the entire country. Finally, after Ararat had squashed many of the rebellions himself with negotiations and military might, he issued a call for Rata and Isris, and those who had followed them to return home. However, Rata was no longer a young man. He had aged greatly, and many of those closest to him wondered if he could even make the return trip to Egypt, let alone resume his position of leadership. Rata, as well, had his own plans as to what was to take place. Though he was old and tired, he called his people together, Egyptians and Nubians alike, all those who had been in close association with him throughout the years of banishment. He pledged each of them to work always for the betterment of humanity, regardless of where they found themselves, for all would not be taking the return journey to Egypt. Rata then promised that because they had been together as a group, he would make it possible for them to recognize one another for the rest of all time. Regardless of where they were born or what age of ages they found themselves in, as long as they worked individually for the good of mankind, they would be drawn together and could continue the work they had begun in Nubia. After the gathering, Rata and 167 of his followers returned to Egypt. There was much rejoicing, with the king's own guard welcoming them back. Finally, Ararat met with the high priest, and the two reinstated some of the former laws as a means of bringing order to the country. The wicked priests were thrown from the temples, and both the Temple of Sacrifice and the Temple Beautiful were reconsecrated in the name of the one true God. Shortly after his return, however, Rata, who appeared to be on the verge of death, withdrew by himself into the Temple Beautiful as a means of regaining his physical health and well-being. He had become convinced that this time he would follow God's will completely, and it was God's will he should finish the work he had only just begun. After much meditation and prayer, and calling upon the secret mysteries he had learned in his period of withdrawal, Rata regenerated his entire body, completely reversing the aging process. He had entered into the silence an old man, appearing more than 100 years old, and yet he emerged perfectly proportioned with the smooth skin of a young man. This feat of being regenerated was seen as a miracle throughout all Egypt, those who did not understand what had been accomplished through the natural workings of the law began to revere the high priest as a god 
and they changed his name to Ra. Isis was raised to a position of leadership as well, as she took the name Isis, becoming the first goddess of Egypt. At the time, gods and goddesses were seen as guardians of the truth. No longer was the right of the king or the high priest to rule questioned, and Egypt began to regain immediate and lasting progress. Order was restored, and the economy began to flourish. A system of financial equality was instated. In fact, Edgar Casey stated that the groundwork for every social reform known to modern man was begun at this time. The law of the land became one which called for the betterment of the whole society. There was not a goal for profit, rather everyone became inspired by the motive of self-improvement. This new society was composed of the very best that we know even in this day. Egypt in its glory began to surpass even the fabled continent of Atlantis. And word of what was occurring in the land of the Nile spread to the four corners of the world. Wise men from the lands that Rata had visited decades earlier now came into Egypt to learn for themselves. Because of achievements in every direction, Rata's original prophecy came to pass and finally, Egypt became the leading nation of the entire world. The Temple of Sacrifice began to be used as the center of family planning and education. Healing techniques were expanded to include a balanced diet, medicines, purification, surgery, exercise, vibrational medicine, and even music and color therapies. The process of healing the slaves of their appendages began anew, and the concept of equality to all finally took root. As Egypt gained in reputation and became known for its quest for spiritual understanding, a world ministry was established, bringing together the greatest minds and philosophers of the day. Emissaries traveled throughout the world. Some went to India, others to Italy, France, Mongolia, Abyssinia, Persia, and Gobi, Greece, the Pyrenees, even the Americas. Leaders from various countries came to learn as well taking the teachings back with them to their own lands. Because the world's knowledge was being gathered in Egypt, a massive library was established in a place which would become Alexandria, housing the manuscripts and documents and writings that were coming in to the country. The library became so renowned and magnificent that legends of it continue to exist to this day. In fact, the Casey readings state that the Essenes and Jesus himself used the library at Alexandria. For the first time, a sense of nationalism rose throughout the country. Ra Ta conceived the idea of erecting a national emblem, a structure so magnificent that it would represent Egypt to the world. In time, it was decided that this structure was to become more than just a national treasure. It would be a repository of the world's knowledge. It would become the primary temple of initiation for spiritual understanding, and it would house, in secrecy, the history of the world. But it was not to be simply the history of the past, but rather a prophetic vision of the history of ages to come. And if Edgar Cayce is correct, that information exists to this day. The location of this magnificent structure the Great Pyramid, was mathematically calculated by establishing the center of all landmass upon the earth. The site decided upon was Giza. The four corners of the structure were laid out, facing the four cardinal points of the globe. The work became a national pastime, nearly 8,000 years older than science would claim. Casey places the construction of the Great Pyramid as beginning 10,490 years B.C. It was a project that would consume the Egyptians for nearly 100 years, and, in spite of his age, it was a project that Ra Ta would see completed. The readings state the pyramid was built by individuals calling upon the forces of nature. By working with the natural laws of vibration and energy, laws which we apparently no longer understand, 
each of the massive stone blocks, more than two million of them, with some weighing as much as 15 tons, were levitated through the air and lowered into place. The religious history of mankind was incorporated into the mathematical structure of the pyramid, with the idea that it would be understood at some point in the future. At the same time the Great Pyramid was being built, another monument began to rise upon the Giza Plateau. The Sphinx was begun as a monument to the past and a guard to the knowledge of the future. It would represent a time in the history of man when there had been creatures who were half man and half beast. It would also guard a subterranean hall of records containing the knowledge of the world and the history of Atlantis. Simultaneously, records were hidden in the Yucatan and in the remnants of Atlantis so that regardless of what cataclysms befell the earth, at least one of the storehouses would remain for generations yet unborn. When both the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx were completed, towering majestically above the desert sands, their glory was greater than had first been imagined. The crown of the pyramid had been covered with a combination of gold, brass, and copper. It glowed as though a fire when hit by the rays of the sun and could be seen for miles across the plains. The Sphinx, 240 feet from haunch to forepaw, with a forehead 80 feet across, appeared as a fitful guardian for this sacred place. When the monuments were completed, Rata's work was complete, and he withdrew into himself for the very last time, and died. For a long while, Egypt remained in magnificence, being ruled by a line of more than 3,000 pharaohs, but none would surpass the glory that had been begun by Rata. And yet, even today, his story is not over. If Edgar Cayce is right, Rata's story is in a sense our story, for each of us had experiences in this Egypt of long ago. But more than that, the story of Rata is a story of human existence containing patterns of 